Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the first motion picture session of the day at AxSafe Entertainment Safety Conference 2021. It is a brain injury responding to a concussion when it happens. This session is kindly sponsored by CMPABC. My name is Natalie Diaz, and I am the safety advisor for motion picture at AxSafe Safety Association. We first ask that everyone please mute themselves in Remo before the session starts. Before we start this session, I would like to first acknowledge the traditional indigenous lands that we all live and gather on today. Although this meeting is online, we still enjoy the pleasure of living within an indigenous territory. To highlight the importance of this acknowledgement, I would like to use you following this session to visit the Native Land Digital website and search the territory on which you are located. That website is www.native-land.ca. Your presenters for these sessions are Dr. Shelina Babu and Laurie Stewart. Dr. Shelina Babu is the Associate Director and Sports Injury Specialist with the BC Injury Research and Prevention Unit, BC Children's Hospital. She works primarily on sport and recreation evidence-based research and knowledge implementation with a particular specialization in concussion TBI, traumatic brain injuries, and their prevention, treatment, and management. Lori Stewart is the stand community liaison and the health and safety performer advocate at UBCP ACTRA. Lori assists injured uh, performers, uh, supports the stand, stand community, and deals with all matters regarding health and safety that affect performers on film set. Lori also sits on the AxSafe Motion Picture Stand Committee, the BC Federation of Labor OHS Committee, the Call Time Mental Health Working Group, and she is a member of BC Concussion Adv Advisory Network. If you have any questions that you would like us to ask Dr. Babu and uh, Lori during question time, please write them into the chat box. Question time we will deal with uh, during our session as well. Before we begin, our presenters would like to, to, know, to learn about their audience first. A pool we, is on the screen right now and we ask for you to take a moment to answer these questions what section do you are working what rule do you have in the industry which union or guild do you belong to and which department do you belong to thank you for that Without any other delay, let me welcome your first speaker for this session, Dr. Selina Babu. Good morning, and thank you for, for having us speak today. Um, as, as Natalie mentioned, um, I've been in the area of concussions and traumatic brain injuries for about 15 years now, and um, we've come a long way in understanding um, more about the brain and the intricacies of the brain um, and what's happening so that, you know, it's not, you had your bell rung anymore. We know it's a brain injury and we're hoping to raise a level of awareness and understanding on the intricacies of the brain today. So uh, it will help you recognize and respond accordingly. Um, I'm a clinical associate professor in the Department of Pediatrics at UBC. I'm an associate director of the BC Injury Research and Prevention Unit at BC Children's Hospital. So thank you again for having me. Yeah. Hi, and uh, I'm Laurie Stewart, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here today, and thank you for joining us um, in learning more about concussions and how we can better respond and recognize um, this sort of very critical injury that, uh, 
you know, my experience is, is uh, partners well with Shalina and, and her research and knowledge. And, you know, I'm kind of the boots on the ground and um, are seeing things happening firsthand and seeing the injuries coming through um, uh, in my time at UBC Piactra, uh, assisting injured workers. We've seen concussions happen in so many crazy and unique ways um, that you would never even dream possible. Um, and um, I've also at, created a um, support group for stunt performers where we would meet monthly and we would talk about concussions and, and really it was just a peer gathering where we would um, discuss treatments and we would discuss how people were doing and check in and we would have people that have had been in post-concussion syndrome for seven plus years and some of the things they were going through. So it it's yielded a lot of incredible insight into uh, the long-term and short-term um, you know, damage that can occur from concussions. And it really has brought that laser focus of we need to do so much more to, um, to sort of mitigate some of the damage that happens when these concussions do happen. So looking forward to getting into it and um, hopefully we can make some progress in that, that way today. Next slide. So we really want to uh, present to you today on three particular areas. Uh, we want you to be able to recognize a potential concussion and understand that, you know, a simple hit to the head could potentially be a concussion. So we'll go over some of the key points related to recognizing a potential concussion, how to respond to a potential concussion causing event, what you should do, or what you need to do, um, and what you need to do immediately, uh, more importantly and how to promote recovery and minimize long-term consequences. So recognize, respond, and recovery are the three areas we'll really dive into today. But just as a reminder, along the way, um, we will take a quick break between each section. So if you have a question, please type it in the chat box or type in your name and we can call on you. My colleague, Kate Turcott is on the call as well, uh, and she'll read out the questions for us to respond. Next slide. Great. So again, for the concussion uh, format or the workshop format, uh, first, we're going to do a presentation on concussions in the entertainment industry. And then uh, we will take some questions throughout that, as uh, Shalina just mentioned. But then after that, there'll be sort of a greater question and answer section where we can address some of the questions you might have. And then at the end, we're going to do a bit of show what you know, which is a little little bit of a you know, question, we, we ask you the questions and we'll see how well you did on, uh, on learning today and what you know about concussions. <laughs> and again, please uh, remember just to put your questions at any time in the chat and those will be monitored and we'll, we'll deal with those as they come up or in the Q&A section at the end. Next slide, slide please. Okay. So concussions in the entertainment industry, um, we're all here because we know that sets and stages are really busy working environments, um, and, but they do tend to have a lot of sort of higher risk activities for brain injuries. Uh, we know that in theater, live performance, and in film industry, there's a lot of construction that goes on, uh, even the construction industry aside from uh, performance and film. Um, has a, a significant amount of concussions and injuries. So um, we bring that into our industries and there's certainly opportunities for concussions there. And then we add to it the things that are you know, unique with such as you know, the dance, the acrobatics and the stunt performance, uh, which are all present their unique risks uh, in the industry. Next slide, please. So along with that, there's other contributing environmental and work process factors that start coming into play that um, make the situation a little little more complicated or a little worse. So we all know the high high pressure environments and the fast pace that things move and, and sometimes working too quickly leads to injuries and accidents, certainly head injuries. Um, things specific, things like inconsistent and poor lighting. So, you know, you take, for example, um, a dancer on stage that's in bright lights that has to then turn to go off into the dark and there's a tripping hazard. <laughs> uh, things like that happen all the time. Um, uneven, varied, slippery work surfaces. Um, a lot of these are pertaining to head injuries that would happen from slips, trips, and falls. Uh, and inappropriate footwear. So dancers for sure. But certainly when we get into stunt performance and people are in costumes, um, I think just about two weeks ago, we had a one member um, with a fracture because he had to do something in cowboy boots that were a size too big. And, and before you know it, something that would be a normal landing was not a normal landing because of the heel and because of the fit of the, the footwear. So 
sometimes those are um, contributing to some of the incidents that we see. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> then there's the big gorilla in the room, which is the fatigue that we all have um, from working fast paced, you know, in, in theater and live performance, you get run of show, which is, you know, a really big push. Uh, and certainly in, in the film industry, you've got the very long hours, um, travel to distant locations. And fatigue can affect things like your decision making. It can absolutely ref um, affect your, your reaction time, uh, making the right decisions in the moment. Um, uh, and then things get exacerbated even more by working nights and the erratic schedule. So the fatigue can really compound and again, lead to you know, injuries that you wouldn't think would normally happen, but they just happen because people have lapses in their attention and reaction time. And another thing is things like temporary structures. You know, we've got set pieces, we've got moving walls, we've got things that um, are not permanent, that, um, you know, sometimes there's misfortune or accidents or things come loose. Uh, again, we had a stunt performer, they were doing a scene where they were flying into a wall. Well, that wall wasn't properly reinforced and it actually fell over out of this, the set stage and landed on somebody walking by. <laughs> So things like that have happened and can happen. Um, and mobile equipment. Um, a couple of weeks ago, we had an incident where there was um, a lift that was being used to move, uh, to hoist a fly screen, a big 20 by 20 screen. Um, and uh, that ended up tipping over and it actually landed on one of our performers and that performer is now out with a concussion. And thankfully, I mean, that's all he ended up with. It could have been significantly worse. Um, so any th things that move, big things that move, <laughs> where things are compact with lots of people, um, again, it, there's just a, a, the, the risks and hazards are there and, and it takes a lot of due diligence to work competently around those things without sustaining injuries and accidents. So uh, next slide, please. So at the end of the day, you've only got one brain. And it's the only organ in your body that can't be transplanted. So we need to really understand and be aware of the intricacies of the brain. A concussion is not just having your bell rung anymore. It is a traumatic brain injury that can be caused by a hit to the head or another part of the body, resulting in an acceleration, deceleration, or rotational movement of the brain. Your brain is only three pounds and it transmits information at about 250 miles per hour. It's really your information highway for breathing, for walking, for talking, for eating. Um, and it really coordinates essentially everything you do in life. So it is vitally important to understand what you need to do if you could potentially have a concussion. Now, some important keynotes and, and myths that are out there is that you know, if you take a hit to the head, and and let me um, let me emphasize that the hit doesn't be substantive. It can be a minor hit. No two co concussions are alike, and people respond very differently to a concussion. So I've had people who have had a hit uh, to the trunk of a car that have been out for months on end, versus you know a soccer player who's had a significant head-to-head -head impact who is fine within a couple of days. Why that's the case, we're, that's what we're trying to figure out. But it's important to understand that just because you don't have symptoms immediately doesn't mean you're fine. Signs and symptoms can appear immediately or have a delayed response up to several days later. There's no diagnostic criteria for diagnosing a concussion. Um, it's basically uh, uh, purely on the concussion causing event previous history, and a few measures that are taken, such as balance, memory, symptom scale, those kinds of things. We don't have, um, you know, a blood test that will conclusively say, yes, this person has a concussion or not, or typically conventional imaging, such as MRI or CT, will appear normal unless you have a bleed to the brain or a skull fracture. It's primarily a functional change that's happening to the brain. You have billions of neural neurons in the brain and glial cells that are, are the transmitting fibers. And when there's the rotation or acceleration and deceleration, these fibers are sheared or torn or kinked, which doesn't allow the information to process uh, normally as it would. So this break in connection in the brain of the fibers need to be reset and rehealed. So you need to uh, recognize it immediately and know how to deal with it accordingly. Next slide, play the slide. 
A hard blow to your head can cause your brain to strike the inside of your skull. During the impact, your brain squeezes against the inside of your skull, sending shock waves through your brain. These shock waves tear or stretch the axons of some neurons. This trauma is called diffuse axonal injury or axonal shearing. The damaged axons reduce normal brain function by inter. And that's what's happening to your brain when there is a concussion. As you can see, with the shearing and tearing of those axons, information can get processed, and that results in the symptoms that you experience. And your symptoms, you know, if again, if recognized and responded to um, correctly, the good news is 70 to 85 percent of those symptoms will resolve in, in, in two to four weeks. However, if you don't recognize them and respond uh, accordingly, uh, then 15 to 30 percent of those individuals will have post uh, persistent symptoms. It, the good news is it's a complex yet treatable injury. But again, I can't stress enough the importance of recognizing it immediately and responding uh, accordingly so that you do fall into the first category of the 70 to 85 percent that resolve within two to four weeks. Next slide. So just building on that a little bit, um, if you have, well, I'll, I'll read this, how a concussion is handled in the minutes, hours, and days after injury can significantly influence the extent of damage and recovery from this injury. If you take a blow to the head or body resulting in um, the forces to the brain, which could cause a concussion and you don't recognize it, and you continue to participate in your activity, you are now three times more likely to sustain a second concussion, potentially more severe in nature uh, and prolonging your recovery. And then again, if that is not recognized and you continue to participate and play you are, or, or do your activity, you're now nine times more likely to stay, sustain brain damage and even death. And two uh, examples of that I can give you is uh, Sidney Crosby. Uh, most of you probably know Sidney Crosby, arguably the world's best hockey player, scores the winning goal in the 2010 Winter Olympics, was sidelined from a concussion. And what Sidney Crosby did was he played in an outdoor winter classic game uh, in February of 2010, uh, I, oh, uh, January of 2010. Uh, it wasn't recognized by himself or his medical team. And he played two days later, again, in a regular NHL season game, took a second hit to the head. And that's what sidelined him uh, at that time indefinitely, but it, it amounted to about 11 months or so. So that's the example of the three times more likely. Uh, and then the nine times more likely sustained brain damage and death, the example I can give you is Rowan Stringer. And I'm not sure if uh, people on the call today know Rowan Stringer. She was a high school rugby player um, and she sustained uh, a hit in one of her rugby games. She was um, experiencing a few symptoms. She played again, uh, again, not recognizing that it was a concussion and then played a third time uh, between Saturday and Wednesday took a third hit and unfortunately she died from um, a bleed to the brain. Um, so it is imperative that we recognize a concussion. I can't stress that enough that it's immediately recognized and dealt with so you don't have long-term complications. Next slide. Okay. Yeah, I, I think uh, that last slide too is, it really is the crux of why we're here is to um, make sure that more than just first aid people are aware of these signs and symptoms and how important it is for peers, supervisors, um, ADs, stage managers, it, like performers in particular are likely going to go again if they've hit their head, just like professional athletes will. Even if they feel like, oh, I've just kind of rung my bell, they'll likely go again and they'll say they're fine. Um, and that's where where a big part of the problem is in, in our culture that we have right now around head injuries that we're hoping to change. So in some of the, um, there were some focus groups that were happening um, on multiple different um, uh, industries and workplaces throughout the province when um, uh, Dr. Google's <coughs> team was creating some <coughs> control, um, uh, protocols. And in that there were interviews with workers. And some of these quotes are from some of the performers that were interviewed. And this is some of the things that they would like others to know in their workplace about concussions. 
uh, more awareness about what the side effects are. So you can recognize it in yourself, but also recognize it in someone else. So that's what we were talking about is being able to help others that you don't have to actually go unconscious to have a concussion. That's a really big myth out there. You don't have to be knocked out. Um, and correct me if I'm wrong, Shalina, but I believe that 90% of concussions do not include being knocked unconscious. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Um, another quote is that it's severe, that it's something that is not like you bang your head and you have a headache. It is actually, it actually affects your entire neur neurology system. It affects you as a human being. It's not different than a power a shortage when the lights go off and you have to be patient. So that's a really good analogy of sort of like a power system um, and things being shut down. And, and these are some of the things, it's, it's very hard to put into words, um, you know, what, what things are like when you have a concussion. And, and um, that's, that's a, you know, one person's attempt at trying to put their finger on it. And um, that's one of the challenges we're facing is that it's, it's hard. It's hard to recognize and hard to put a, put a finger on. Mm -hmm. Okay, next slide, please. So as I mentioned, uh, the brain is really a complex organ. Uh, and this slide basically shows you that different areas of the brain can be affected, uh, leading to the various symptoms that someone may be experiencing. So as I said, your brain is your, your, your organ that controls your, your daily functioning. And a disruption in any of those lobes, frontal, parietal, um, which is the top, occipital, the back, or temporal lobes, can result in the symptoms that one is seeing. So um, the next slide will give you a better understanding of what controls what areas and what symptoms may be felt. Next slide. Brain is injured. Physical symptoms of concussion may include headache, nausea, dizziness, poor muscle coordination, light sensitivity, blurred vision, ringing in the ears, slurred speech, and loss of consciousness. You may have mental and emotional symptoms, including disorientation, confusion, memory loss, inability to focus and concentrate, irritability, and depression. So, mm -hmm. so um, that gives you an idea of what areas affect the symptoms that you see. So, but I want to be clear that you do not have to have all these symptoms to be diagnosed with a concussion. You can basically just have one um, symptom and still be diagnosed with a concussion because uh, it, it, it varies so much and it's not linear. You may be fa feeling fine one day and not so good the next day. You may have one symptom one day and three symptoms the next day. So it really does vary and it allows healthcare professionals to understand how to treat and manage your concussion. So understand, um, you know, if you have headache, dizziness, nausea, chances are the lower brainstem area of the brain has been affected. And that allows, say, physiotherapists to work with you on what's known as cervical vestibular therapy to alleviate those symptoms. So it's really important to recognize the symptoms that you're experiencing and get immediate help. So we're going to take a break for a minute and just ask Kate, uh, do we have any questions along the way for the respond? Yes, good morning. Uh, we have one question, and it's just to ask um, Shalina if you could go over again what puts you at the situation for being three times or nine times more likely um, <clears throat> to sustain more damage. Sure, yeah. So if you sustain a hit to the head that results in the moving and shaking or jarring of the brain, which could potentially be a concussion-causing event, you and you continue to participate in uh, in activity or play a sport or a recreational game, you are now three times more likely to sustain a second concussion and potentially more severe in nature. Keep in mind when you have that initial um, incident or event and you don't experience any symptoms or signs immediately, we ask that you err on the side of caution and refrain from activity for two days, just to see that the, sign, the signs or the symptoms don't appear subtly over the course of the next few days. And again, if the second one is not recognized and you continue to participate in your activity, 
you're now nine times more likely to sustain brain damage and possibly even death. So if so, the, the key here is to recognize if there's been an impact to your head or another part of the body resulting in a whiplash type motion of your head forward, backwards or rotation, say uh, in stunt performers of fight, um, refrain from activity for two days, recognize that you could potentially have a concussion uh, and stop what you're doing for two days just to err on the side of caution. Uh, we have a couple of more questions that have come in. Okay. Uh, one is about if symptoms don't always appear immediately, can medical professionals assess it accurately right away? And I think that content is coming up in the presentation. Do you want to say anything about that right now? Yeah, we'll, we'll, re we'll uh, respond to that uh, in the next section. But essentially, like I said, we, we're really treating ambigu uh, complexities of a concussion with ambiguity. The diagnosis is purely based on previous history of concussion, how you're feeling at the time, and in, including your symptoms. Um, typically, you're given uh, a, a few balance tests, a few memory tests, and, a, and the diagnosis is made based on those parameters. Having said that, um, again, I can't emphasize enough that you may not have any symptoms immediately. So if you feel you've had a significant impact resulting in the movement of the brain or the head, take a few days off, just watch yourself. Again, you've only got one organ, one brain that controls your daily functioning, and you want to be able to um, function normally moving forward. So you're really the best advocate for your health. Um, and I encourage you to really respond um, accordingly. And one third question, is there a grading system workplaces can use to help manage return to work or are symptoms too erratic and recovery too individual to each patient? So I can touch on that. Um, there's no grading system, but in the concussion awareness training tool for workplace and workers, uh, we walk you through some steps. So the current evidence, so the science around concussions is changing rapidly. So, uh, you know, 10 years ago, it was go into a dark room and don't come out until you're symptom free. Then that changed four years later to, okay, don't go into a dark room, just don't do anything until you're symptom free. And now what we're recommending and what the evidence is showing is that you need immediate cognitive and physical rest for 48 hours, and then very slowly and actively integrate back to activity. Um, again, not linear, you may be feeling fine one day and not so good another day, but a little bit of exercise and a little bit of activity one day at a time has shown to really help in your recovery. And we have a, um, a, a, a protocol or a guideline in the CAT workers and workplace that helps you walk through the stages to recovery. Another question, um, which one am I going for here? Sorry. Uh, would workers comp cover taking a couple of days off to see if you have symptoms? And then there will be another question after that. Yeah, I'll take that one. Um, sure. Yeah, if you if you miss any work as a re as a result of an injury that happens in the workplace, and you've um, been suspected of, of possibly having a concussion and you're missing work, then yes, and you would need to call uh, WCB. Um, what a really important part of that process is making sure you've reported the injury to your employer. And that's usually through first aid um, on sets or in, you know, live performance um, and make sure that that's documented. And then it's important to go to a doctor. Um, you know, the proper reporting to work safe to, to the workers' compensation board requires mm -hmm. three reporting mechanisms, one from the employer, one from a physician and one from yourself. So once those three, everyone's reported, um, then for sure you could be um, compensated as you should be for uh, time missed at work. And for and any sports or therapy you need to. Yeah, and just to add, when we built the, the CAT for workers and workplaces, we did collaborate with WorkSafe BC, so they are aware of it. And WorkSafe BC, uh, my understanding now, has a concussion specific program. Um, I can't remember the name of it exactly, but they have one as well. So they're really taking it uh, a lot more seriously. And, and then they understand the severity a lot more than they did say five years ago. <clears throat> uh, another question, are there any outlines or guides available to self monitor for symptoms after the person has left the site? Laurie, do you want to 
Well, yes, and we're getting to it, which is great. We have, um, uh, we collaborated, uh, Dr. Babol and her team, and um, with ActSafe, we collaborated to create um, a concussion protocol or a pathway, we call it, for the motion picture and uh, live performance sector, which specifically addresses some of the concerns, uh, especially around performers and, and their risk of those sort of second impacts and going again. Um, and so that will be um, made available to you, hopefully through um, the conference. We haven't <laughs> figured how we can disseminate that, but we will absolutely make sure that people have access to it. Um, and it is currently available on the ActSafe website. Um, and it can be used, it can, it can help people once they're at home. Um, it can help your, uh, you know, your family members or friends or, or partners or whoever you're with when you go home to help monitor for more serious signs, red flag symptoms. Uh, and we'll get into that shortly as well. Um, but yes, absolutely, there, are, there is resources and there's lots of resources available at CAT online as well, um, which I'm sure Selena, Selena will get to as well. Okay, can we move on? Are we next slide? Great. Okay. Let's see. Okay. All right. Um, so as we just discussed, <laughs> we did create a pathway and we will be, again, the whole uh, gist of this is to make sure that we're stopping, we're assessing, we're monitoring, and we're managing. Um, and to sort of get into it a little bit, I want to share with you some of the experiences that we have had and the reasons why um, we've gone down this route to, to find avenues to better respond and manage the concussions. So next slide, please. Okay, so some problems we see. Workers being sent home and allowed to self-drive. So um, an example that we had with one of our members is a performer um, sustained a suspected concussion on set. Um, she was uh, sent home uh, because she wasn't feeling well. All of a sudden her legs were feeling weird. Some very strange uh, symptoms started coming up. So they thought, well, you must be unwell. We're gonna send you home. They let her drive. Um, she actually had to pull over on the highway because her vision was changing and she started feeling dizzy. So this would have been about three or four hours post incident. Um, luckily for her, she um, had the wherewithal to actually pull over. Um, you know, at that point, she really was a risk to herself and the greater public of driving behind the wheel, feeling dizzy and with vision issues. Uh, and she was, you know, technically rescued from the side of the highway by her husband who came and got her. And I think they got her car towed later or picked up later. Um, so we never want to let anybody who's had a suspected concussion or is exhibiting any kind of concussion symptoms to drive, um, whether that's home or whether that's to medical care, um, they should not drive themselves. Next slide, please. Okay. Uh, another thing we see quite commonly is um, people being given Advil or Tylenol as sort of like a, to help fix the headache situation. So say somebody's taking even a minor knock and we now know that even a minor <laughs> knock can cause big problems. It doesn't have to be a really big blow. Um, and when you give Advil and Tylenol, it can um, mask the symptoms that we want to be paying att attuned to. Um, and it can do other things. It can also actually thin the blood. So in cases where there might be a possible brain bleed, having thin blood, of course, can ex exacerbate that problem. Um, I'm not sure, Selena, if you wanted to add to that. Yeah, so uh, basically, if, if someone has a minor headache initially, <clears throat> if that is a slow bleed to the brain, that headache would progressively be getting worse over the course of the next few hours. Um, and if you take ibuprofen or Advil, which is an anti-inflammatory, that would mask the symptoms. So you wouldn't be able to recognize that your headache is progressively getting worse and to immediately go to, um, to, to seek medical care in the emergency department uh, for, a scan, for a scan to be done to rule out a bleed to the brain. So initially, uh, we recommend that ibuprofen or Advil Advil or Tylenol not be given just to mask symptoms, which could be red flags for something more serious. <clears throat> okay, next slide, please. Okay, um, so this is specific to performers. Um, so, and we've touched on this already. Um, when a performer say does a, a, a stunt or, or something that they need to do again, quite frankly with stunts, we're having to do multiple takes of things. So let's say you've hit your head 
and the performer says, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm good to go, I'm good to go. By letting them keep going and doing that other take, we start to get into that sort of potential for a second impact syndrome or where we now know that they're already three times more likely to you know, sustain a concussion if they go again and then compound what they've had can lead to a really dangerous situation. Um, I mean, this was the real crux of why I reached out to uh, Shalina and her team to create something because of the risk, exactly what happened to the rugby player. Um, mm -hmm. Doing exactly the same thing again within a short period of time when you've just rattled your brain and now you're gonna go rattle it again and that brain shut down that can happen, which potentially can lead to longer term, more significant brain damage and or can be fatal, which just absolutely is terrifying to think about. So um, we wanna make sure that those interventions happen. And in the case of performers, that intervention for in my experience, most likely will not come from the performer because they're pleasers. They wanna go again, they wanna please their coordinator. They wanna make their actor look good. They wanna please the production. There's lots of money on the line. If they don't finish the shot, the pressure is huge to complete the shot, but we need to have a stop and we need to make sure we're following the protocols and, and, and making those interventions happen. And whether that's first aid or a supervisor or a stunt coordinator or, you know, stage manager or any of those people, it, it, it's going to take a team to make sure we're recognizing these things. Next slide, please. Laurie, can I just add, um, yeah. adding to that, um, you know, in the most simplistic uh, way to explain it, um, you know, when, when there's the initial concussion, I said, you've got the sharing and tearing of those axons, the billions of axons and neurons that you have in the brain. So initially you've got the sharing and the tearing of that connection. And you're not allowing that the brain, the time it needs to reconnect again. And you continue to participate in the activity. Now you're getting more sharing and tearing of more axons and diminishing the capability of those axons to repair. And again, if you continue, now you're really disconnecting all the neural pathways or connections in the brain. And that's what, what leads to long-term uh, brain damage because once they're, they're torn to the, to the level that they can't reconnect, then there's nothing you can do. So again, heed the warning that initially your sharing and tearing can be repaired. So take that time so that it can be repaired and you don't get to the level where they're so disconnected that repairing is, it cannot occur. Oh well, yeah, great, great point. Thank you. Thanks. All right. Um, so this is something we see that is really unique. Um, I think probably to stunt performance, but certainly may come into acrobats and dance and, and things as, as well. Failing to recognize that multiple takes, multiple falls, head reactions. So people doing like the punching and faking that they've been punched in the head repetitively that shaking of the brain, they really are these cumulative sub-concussive actions and forces that can again lead to those shearings and tearings um, that can lead to concussions. I am seeing coming across my desk more over the past five or six years, more instances of people having concussion symptoms and ending up with concussions where they have not hit their head. So, you know, I'll give you an example. We had one, uh, one stunt woman who was recently doing falls from about eight feet onto a crash mat. That was fine. They, she did it by herself. And then there was another person. And then there was two more people. And the more people they added, the firmer the mat got. Uh, it was soft at first. But then when you add more people and they're falling on the same mat, it got firmer. And she landed maybe a little funny with her neck tilted on one of them where they had to turn and land. Um, and she felt something weird and she wasn't sure what was going on. And, you know, she had a little bit of a headache and then they moved on later and did the next actions where they were flying and being spun around in a circle. So, so now she's just, I'm laughing. I shouldn't be laughing. Um, you know, she just did some damage to her brain and then just scrambled it. Um, and so after that, there was a concussive episode where, and then, you know, people are saying, well, she never hit her head you know, how could that be a concussion? And how can she be off work? And even dealing with work safety, see there, you know, we're, it's an education process, certainly I'm working on is to try and say, you don't have to hit your head. We're seeing this more and more. And it's, it's similar, you know, I was mentioning to Shalina, it's like that shaken baby syndrome, where you have, you know, when babies are shaken, 
by caregivers or parents or whoever, and they end up with brain damage. Well, we're doing that, but we're doing that as adults. So we're doing it to ourselves and the actions that we're doing by doing it too much. Mm -hmm. So um, again, in, in stunt performance, we're seeing a lot of excessive rehearsing because in rehearsals, we do what's called pre-visualization where they're filming everything to show to the director, to get approval, to get concept approval. And so there's lots and lots and lots of takes being done in rehearsal. And then maybe on the day of filming, they do it once or twice or three times. So a lot more damage is being done in rehearsals. Um, so certainly encouraging, we want more first aid attendants and things, uh, which often they are at, at <coughs> rehearsals and stuff, they should be there. Um, and, and just to be aware of this knowledge, you do not have to hit your head to start seeing this damage. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, next slide, please. Okay. Uh, I think we just said this, um, you know, understanding that it doesn't take much. Uh, I'll give you an example. We had one stunt performer who, um, who had concussion history and he was doing something, he got pushed back and he hit his head on the edge of a, a shelf on a wall, just a little, like a little bonk. Like I have the footage, it's barely anything to look at. Um, and that person ended up, because of their concussion history, ended up being on uh, long-term disability for over two and a half years, uh, went into depression, <laughs> uh, into financial hardship, uh, had suicidal tendencies. Um, I. I mean, the amount of time I spent with this member was, was incredible. Um, thankfully, he has since come out of it, um, but it took a, a tremendous amount of work and a tremendous amount of supports and multidisciplinary approach to his healing um, and, and uh, sheer grit and determination to heal. Um, and, uh, you know, it, when, when we're dealing with any individual, whether it's a, a stagehand or, or a crew member or a performer, or it doesn't matter, we, we will not necessarily know if there's a concussive history. And again, how someone hits their head, what the mechanism is, um, every person is different and every concussion is different and everyone's history is different. And again, that erring on the side of caution is so important. And if someone says, wow, I really have a headache from that little hit to my head, we need to believe them and we need to support them and we need to go through protocol. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, another uh, focus group question of what people would like you to know in the workplace. Uh, I think any hit to the head is potentially serious. We need to take it way more seriously. You can't put a cast on a brain. You can't massage it. You can't make it feel better. Once it's damaged, it can be life altering. And this from a performer's perspective, again, I get that we have to go again. If we sprained our ankle, tape it up and suck it up and we finish the job. That's part of what we do but I really, really, really want this community to know that we're gonna draw the line at the head and that we're not going to go again and that we're not going to shake it off, that it's a pause, that it's a stop and it's an assess. And if necessary, remove. So I think, you know, that's coming from someone who's, I know the individual had actually said that quote, that's coming from someone who went down the rabbit hole for years with multiple concussions and post-concussion syndrome and how life-altering it can be and how important it can be. Um, and again, that's why we're here, is to find that line on, on that response, the recognizing response. Yeah, and if I can add, just think of it this way. If you have, say, a, a headache or any of the symptoms, think of it as your brain telling you, hang on a minute, I just need a couple of days to, to reset, uh, and then we can go um, accordingly after that. But think of it as a way of your brain talking to you to tell you uh, to take a pause, essentially. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. Um, do we want to answer any questions before we get into protocol or how are we feeling? Kate, are there any uh, questions that are relevant to what we've just covered? I've got three questions that have come up. Um, one is about monitoring um, one is asking about getting slides. So I'll bring that one up at the end. And one, actually one is a question that I think we could do now. And then the other one, we can wait until the next section. because I think it's more applicable. Okay. So the question here is, can concussions lead to chronic, can, can concussions lead to chronic, uh, brain injury? Can that lead to another organ failure? Um, the example is given of Bob Probert, who was a hockey player and he died of a heart attack. Right. Um, so I have in, in my review of the evidence, I haven't seen anything linking 
uh, repeat concussions to organ failure, such as, as the heart. But uh, there is a lot of work being done um, in the area of chronic traumatic encephalopathy or CTE. And what, what uh, researchers are finding is that from repetitive head impacts, such as um, enforcers in hockey or football, the brain composition is changing. And the brain composition um, basically mirrors that of elderly dementia or Alzheimer patients. So um, there's a protein in the brain called the tau protein. And at some point that is triggered um, in many of these um, athletes or individuals. We don't know what the focal point is or what the catalyst is to start uh, the tau protein to then escalate in numbers in the brain to cause um, CTE or dementia. And that leads to mental health challenges, um, memory loss, uh, anger, depression, um, and I believe uh, Probert was experiencing those uh, symptoms. But I will say that in all the autopsies that have been done at the Boston Center for Traumatic Encephalopathy, uh, Dr. Anne McKee, or back at in Ontario, um, not all autopsy brains showed it. So it was seen in a 17 year old high school player uh, whereas it wasn't seen in, in a few, um, you know, football players. So this is the conundrum of the brain. Why is it happening in not 100% of the cases? Well, and, and what's the trigger point? And that's uh, what we are trying to aim to understand. We've come a long way in the last decade in understanding the brain, but I will say that we have a long way to go to understand why two people respond so differently, recover so differently, why some have CTE and others don't. Um, and again, that's, that's just the complexity of this organ. Yeah. So I think that, you know, the takeaway before we move on to is changing this culture around reporting um, you know, that in, instance, they, they traditionally call it the cowboy culture, you know, we, you know, hang on tighter next time, and <laughs> get up and do it again. <laughs> and, yeah. and certainly this is something that is very much ingrained into the dance culture from a very early age is that the show must go on. Um, and, uh, you know, I think many, many performers and stunt performers and dancers will realize that that is part of your job to a certain extent. But I think, again, you know, like this comment says, is that we need to draw the line when it comes to the head. Mm -hmm. um, it, 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 there's no replacing it and the, 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 the consequences are too high and the risks are too high. Mm -hmm. So, you know, maybe, you know, be selective in your cowboy culture if you need to, to finish that take and you just need to tape up your ankle and then you can get to the hospital. But mm -hmm. let's not do that with the brain. We can't afford to. It's not, uh, it, it, it's just not worth it. Yeah. All right, let's move on. Unless uh, the rest of the questions we can save, right, Kate? Yes. Okay, great. Okay, uh, here we go. Okay, so uh, next slide, please. All right, so this is our concussion awareness response and management for the motion picture film and live performance industries. This is the concussion protocol that we made. Uh, kind of akin to a protocol that you would see for football, like their concussion response protocol or hockey or other professional sports. Uh, when I met with Shalina, I'm, I'm like, why don't we have something like this for the workplace? Why is there not a concussion protocol that everybody knows about and everybody goes to and then when X happens, then you bring out the protocol and everybody follows the pathway and it's a clear, clear way for everybody to be on the same page about things. So we created this. Um, this document um, with the help of AxSafe um, was approved by all of the local film unions. It's been widely embraced by the live performance sector as well. Um, it was approved by the Canadian Media Producers Association and also endorsed by the American Media Producers Association, the AMPTP. Um, and so it's basically been given the, the thumbs up green stamp of approval. Um, and we are certainly encouraging all first aid to, you know, use this, get training on it. Uh, I would encourage everybody to <laughs> have a copy of this. I'm always telling the stunt performers, print this off, put it in your stunt bag, make sure you have it so you can help your friend. Um, you know, dancers, same thing would be a great idea. Make sure you've got a copy of this. You do not need any training to use this pathway. Um, it really is written with the intent that anybody can use it to make uh, medically informed decisions um, by following the pathway. 
Um, all right, shall we move on? Next slide, please. So what we'll do is we'll walk you through the pathway section by section. So the first section is really if there is a significant impact <clears throat> or motion to the head or body that can cause the brain to move inside the skull that could potentially lead to a suspected concussion, stop what you're doing. Stop immediately, call for onsite first aid and immediately assess for red flags. Now those red flags are identified there. If you've got neck pain or tenderness, double vision, seizure or convulsions, weakness or tingling, burning in the arms or legs, severe or increasing headache, loss of consciousness, deteriorating consciousness state, vomiting, or increasing restless, agitated, or combative. If any of those um, are seen within the minutes after the event, uh, immediately um, seek medical attention and go to the emergency department. That is vital. And especially if you have an increasing, progressively worsening headache. And remember, do not give Advil or Tylenol immediately after the event. Next slide. Okay, looking at the right uh, side of the screen. Um, so if you don't have any, the person doesn't have any of the red flag symptoms, then you just go to the next step and you assess for the signs and symptoms of concussion. So the first box de deals with, does this person have an increased risk of concussion? So this is what we've been talking about, that concussion history. Is somebody currently recovering from a concussion? Um, are they experiencing any kind of concussion symptoms previously? So if any of those get checked off, then we go down into the next um, box, which is the concussion signs and symptoms. And those are your more classic signs, the dizziness, dizziness, the headaches, um, the nausea, um, light and sound sensitivity, fatigue, you know, sadness, neck pain, um, more of those generic, um, you know, more, more um, common symptoms. So if any of those show up are checked off. So if any of those boxes have been checked off, then that person needs to go get assessed. So that leads to, I'm going to point on my screen, right? <laughs> <laughs> that leads to the, the red box. If yes to any of the above, seek medical attention. If none of those boxes are checked off, that leads us to the orange box. If no symptoms, and then specifically for performers, refrain from repeating actions that caused the initial impact and or the repetitive jarring motions. So if, if stunt guy was doing the fight scene with lots of head takes and lots of reactions and falling to the ground, you know, maybe since they're not showing any of these symptoms, maybe let's place them in the background if we can, so they're not doing something as, as involved, uh, but you do not want that person shaking their head and you do not want them falling down right now. So if they can do alternate work where it's safe to do so, where they're not going to um, add that next level of risk to themselves, then that would likely be okay. Um, but really we want to um, make sure that for that next 48 hours, that those performers and all workers, any, anybody is monitoring, they're limiting their activity and they're monitoring for the next 48 hours for symptoms. And then if there's no symptoms, then returning to normal activity after the 48 hours. And then to, con uh, to cover the, red, the left side, if any of those red flags um, were seen, then you need to call an ambulance or seek immediate medical care. And they will assess you accordingly in the hospital, whether you need further um, investigative um, scanning, for instance, whether you need a CT scan or an MRI, and they will, um, there's a, a, a rule that you follow, a CT head rule that's followed, whether that's warranted or not. Or, or it may be, um, you know, they may say that you have a concussion and you need to, um, go home and rest. But I want to highlight that um, anecdotally, from what I'm hearing, a lot of physicians are not giving the correct uh, guidance or advice uh, on what needs to be done. So for instance, you know, previously, it was it was told wake the patient up every two hours and see if they're okay. Don't let them sleep through the night. And that is not the case. You want the individual to sleep throughout the night because you want the brain to rest. If you wake the patient up, then you're waking up the brain and you're not allowing it to rest. So you want the individual to rest. 
Um, you certainly you can monitor them for normal breathing, normal skin color, those kinds of things, not hurled up in the fetal position, but you do want to let them rest. And chances are, if you're released from the hospital, um, you know, you'll be fine sleeping through the night. Um, and you want to limit physical and, and cognitive activity for 48 hours for two days. And that means no activity whatsoever where you can have another impact to the head. Uh, and limiting your time on screens, computers, TVs, um, you know, playing uh, board games that require you to really think, because uh, you don't want to use your brain. Essentially, you want to do nothing to your brain. You can do mindless activities, coloring, drawing, um, yoga, maybe, um, that won't impact the head, but you really want to rest over the course of the next two days. And if you find that whatever you're doing is making your symptoms worse, stop doing that within the 48 hours and rest further. Stop and don't exacerbate those symptoms. After the 48 hours, uh, then we highly recommend that you follow a return to something protocol. So a return to work protocol, a return to activity, a return to school or a return to sport. There's subtleties between the different ones, but essentially the idea is the same that you want to gradually and slowly increase your level of activity over the course of six stages. Um, and you may regress to a stage um, where you're doing too much, you regress back to the previous stage, not stage one, but the previous stage. And then you wait 24 hours and you try again and progress uh, the next day. Um, next slide. Okay. Um... So this is just about the, the bottom left-hand box dealing with the mental health issues. And we have touched on this already as well. So during the course of reco uh, recovery from a concussion, um, seek medical attention for mental health challenges. And certainly we see probably, you know, in my experience, number one, depression, um, irritability, um, impulse control, anger management issues, um, tr sleep, sleep issues, having trouble uh, falling asleep, which is really problematic if the brain can't rest and heal. Um, so again, that's someone that's going to need um, much more support and, and assistance. And really, I think the big thing for all of us in a return to work situation is if we've got somebody that's trying to return to work from concussions, and it's, and it's been a long time, is to be empathetic and to be patient, and to be understanding and to be aware of, of some of these things that, you know, often people say, oh, that person's changed ever since they hit, hit their head, they're not the same person, they're a different person. And that can absolutely happen. Um, but we really just need to be informed and have that patience and empathy and support of that individual because what they're going through is very, very challenging. Mm -hmm. Okay, next slide, please. All right, so just to sum up this section, um, you know, we can all be a little bit more mindful of the big picture and, and knowing, I think most importantly, that that brain can't be replaced. It can't put, we can't put a bandaid on it, um, that we can all be part of the solution of, of recognizing and better response of concussions. So to, uh, you know, finish up with some of these focus group comments that people would want you to know how to recognize it, that it's more than just headaches and short-term memory loss and sensitivity to like, like the depth that it can get to. So you, take it more seriously. How to manage it, prevention of it ever occurring in the first place. Having everyone educated so that we're not in these positions where repeating unnecessary damage to the brain basically occurs. And then support for someone uh, who's been going through it. So those are some of the messages that people wanted you to know. So um, with that, I think, um, do we have, it looks like we've got a few questions. Do we want to have those questions now or do we want to hold? I know we're getting tight on time. Um, I think we're good to go with the questions since uh, we're blending our Q&A with the presentation. Um, a couple that uh, concern the information we've just gone through. One is, is it best to keep a suspected concussion person on site for monitoring or send to hospital before green lighting them for driving home? So... That depends on the situation. If there are red flags present, if the person is disoriented, confused, wobbly, um, you know, call call a nine one one, call for an ambulance, or have someone um, drive them to the uh, to the hospital immediately. Um, but if there are very subtle symptoms, 
Um, I would recommend that that individual, you know, be be driven, driven home immediately and not drive on their own and and closely monitored, at least within the first 24 to 48 hours. Lori, anything to add to that? Yeah, um, I think when in doubt, I would send them to medical aid. Mm-hmm. And certainly whether that's with a, you know, a transport driver driving them or someone, someone else driving, they should not drive. Um, you know, only a medical professional can diagnose a concussion. Mm-hmm. A paramedic cannot diagnose a concussion. EMS cannot diagnose a concussion. First aid cannot diagnose a concussion. Um, they can, we can only recognize the potential symptoms and signs. Mm-hmm. So to, you know, for workplaces as well, you don't want to have had someone that may have had a concussion in the workplace um, that may harm themselves or in their actions, you know, might create an accident that, that, that harms someone else as well. So uh, I would always err on the side of caution and get them driven to medical aid for assessment um, uh, and, and get that checked off first. It's also really important if there is a work safe claim, the sooner that that is dealt with, the cleaner the claim is, uh, you know, sometimes head injury claims can get very complicated and um, not smooth because, for example, people with concussions might forget to show up to an appointment and, and you know, um, you know, work safe BC might say, well, they missed, they didn't show their appointment, they must be fine. Yeah. Um, but, you know, we get into some complicated things there. So I would, the, the, the better and cleaner, the faster the reporting and checking in. And if they're fine and they're great and they're clear to come back, great. Yeah. But that medical professional needs to make that call. And uh, just just to add to that, uh, the concussion awareness training tool that I'll speak about in a minute also has a resource on there about driving and concussion. Another question, is there an easy way to determine if the victim can be walked off site or should have a stretcher? So again, um, I think the stretcher would only be warranted if the red flags are present. Um, if there are the other symptoms other than the red flags, then that individual more than likely can be assisted off to seek uh, medical attention. Yeah. Uh, another question, do stunt pro- departments already follow this pathway and guidelines, or is there still a lot of awareness and education legwork to be done? Oh, there's so much work that still needs to be done, but they're so sick of me talking about this <laughs> and presenting every meeting we have. We mention concussions and I mentioned the, the protocol and I try and get it stuffed in people's stunt bags. And, um, you know, we're working with AxDape. We, we actually want to do specific concussion education for first aid attendants uh, through AxSafe and really spend a good chunk on that because some of the traditional first aid training it doesn't spend that much time on concussions from what I've heard from some people maybe like half an hour or you know maybe maybe the most an hour's worth of training um for a first for a first level three occupation first aid level three um so you know we think there's way more to it and way more that's industry specific um that needs some, some um in, more education to make sure that that the bigger picture is being seen but yeah i'm we're trying they're so sick of me talking about this it's wonderful um and i will i will not stop because uh, you know my work with the concussion support group and seeing how devastating these effects can be on their colleagues and their friends um it, it's really um it's very very sobering and and i you know we wouldn't wish this on anybody mm-hmm. so the work will continue <laughs> but many are have- yet. It has worked so far. We actually have had some cases where it has been used and it has made a difference. So, yay. (laughs) Do you have any advice on avoiding screens in a healthy way, whereas it's a cornerstone of how we interact in pandemic times? Yeah, so screens are um, a big part of our life, as we know. Um, And especially for those who are experiencing sensitivity to light, uh, as one of their symptoms, we recommend that you add a, um, a blue blocker to your, um, to your computer screen uh, or your um, iPhones, uh, which helps uh, somewhat. Uh, it doesn't alleviate it completely, but it does help somewhat uh, when you're recovering. Um, the other thing that we recommend is for sensitivity to light is also wearing sunglasses. Uh, which also helps. And it's okay to wear it until you feel better because that doesn't exacerbate your symptoms and allows the brain to heal accordingly. Yep. Uh, one more question for this section. Should rock music style headbanging be avoided altogether? 
That's a that's a new one I haven't heard before. <laughs> My experience, I would limit it from what I'm seeing. Um, really, when you think about, if you think about your brain, your your skull is like an egg, and there's that yolk in the middle, and you're shaking it back and forth constantly. You know, there could be some of that subconcussive forces happening. And, you know, sometimes after a rock concert, you go home with a headache anyway, because it's so loud, but maybe it's because you were shaking your head too much. <laughs> Good question. That's a great question. Yeah. Um, I, I would, uh, from what I've seen, I would, I would err on caution. I really would. I've seen yeah. I mean, I, I don't know how to comment to that. I mean, there's no <laughs> evidence in the literature related to head banging from rock music and concussions, but you know, I have to agree with uh, Lori, if you're constantly doing it, but you'd have to be doing it daily um, for a good amount of time. So, you know, if that's the case, then yeah, avoid it. But you know, if it's just once in a in a while at a concert, I'm sure it's fine. <laughs> okay. There are, there are oh. two questions. I just wanted to let you know, there are two questions that we haven't addressed yet. Um, they're not really pertaining to any particular section, but one is wondering if there is a PDF version of the pathway to, to make available to everybody. And mm -hmm. also someone's asked if it's a, if there's a chance of getting the PowerPoint slides so they're able to review the content later. Yeah, I, I mean, as for the PDF, that's certainly available. It's available, um, I believe it's on the Concussion Awareness Training Tool or Lori, I'm sure can, yeah. can send the PDF. Uh, and I'm yeah. happy to share the slides as well. Uh, and perhaps maybe Natalie could put the link in the uh, chat box. There we go. Excellent from Manu. Um, it's the link to the, there's a PDF and a poster that are available on the Axsafe website. And I think the link just got put in there. So that's great. Okay. So moving along, I want to just uh, make you aware. Next, uh, next, next slide. Uh, of the concussion awareness training tool that we developed. We developed this tool in, uh, it was first launched in 2013, but we came up with the idea, I think we started in 2011. And the premise around that was the repeated calls I'd get in my office from um, you know, parents or individuals suffering from a concussion or who do I go or where do I see or the doctor saying he's had his bell rung, go home. Or So we recognized there was a disconnect in the level of understanding and awareness around concussions. Uh, so what we did is we conducted what's known as a, an extensive literature review and an environmental scan to say what exists in the world related to concussion training. Uh, and there wasn't a lot. There was a couple of tools, but there was a cost associated with it. And our government said, if we want uh, individuals to learn about concussions, we're not going to charge them. We want to make a free, accessible, up-to-date, relevant resource. And then what we did is we conducted focus groups with all these audiences that you see on your screen to say, if we build something, what do you want? How can this help you? What information do you need? So for example, as physician said, we are so inundated, we want the most amount of information in the least amount of time. Parents said, we want a one-stop shop of information because when I Google uh, concussions, I get millions of hits. How do I know what's accurate, credible, reliable? Um, you know, teachers said, we want to know how to support our, uh, our students. Uh, employer said, we want to understand how to recognize and support our employees. So this is what we built, the concussion awareness training tool. Um, and it really ranges in audiences. Each module for each audience has an e-learning course ranging from about 30 minutes to about 50 minutes or, or so, as well as relevant resources on the site. Next slide. So specific to the uh, tool for workers and workplaces, we really wanted to make it relevant for employers and employees. We conducted an international review uh, and then we conducted focus groups with workers, with adults, with families of workers and adults, employers, workplaces, safety associations, unions. Uh, and we work with people in the industry like WorkSafe BC to say, we want to build this, we want to make it relevant, we want to make it um, really focused and, and hits the mark on achieving what individuals want. Um, so that's what we did. We took all the feedback and we launched the workers and workplaces. Next slide. Specific to my earlier comment, one of the resources, uh, not one, but some of the resources on the site are the return to work play, sport, activity strategies. And you can see here, this is a six stage return to work strategy. And it really guides you 
how to proceed from stage one all the way to stage six, and what you need to do uh, to progress or regress to the previous stage. We also have packages, uh, you know, such as this one, Concussion Resource for Workers and Workplaces, that gives you all the relevant resources in one document. So, um, for instance, um, we developed a questions to ask, ask your doctor, because I would get calls saying, oh, I forgot to ask my doc this, or I forgot to ask my doc that. Mm -hmm. So we built this one resource that you can actually, you know, they're perforated pages, you can take it to your doctor, and hopefully they can answer the questions. The second reason we developed that particular resource was because if your doctor can't answer some of those questions, you might want to seek a second opinion. Um, so we have inherent kind of um, thoughts behind developing these messages. So these are all available uh, on the website as well, free of charge. Next slide. So just to, to you know, give you a couple of, of summary slides, concussions are really an invisible injury. You can't see it. Um, if someone's going through it, you can't visibly see it like a casted arm or an ankle. It's an acute urgent health problem. And we are seeing, um, increases in, in numbers. In fact, the numbers have quadrupled over the past decade. Now that's not to say the numbers of concussions have quadrupled. That's probably also has to do with more awareness and education around this injury. But, you know, it's estimated that one in 165 Canadian adults suffers a concussion each year. And the diagnosis and treatment is challenged by the nonspecific vague symptoms. So what I mean by that is you know, if, if someone comes into the eMERGE with um, nausea, headache, dizziness, those are signs of, say, the common flu as well. So we really have to be careful in diagnosing this injury based on the circumstance of the event. If there was a concussive event, have they had previous history of concussions? Because there is an additive effect of repeat concussions. And the more concussions you have, the longer it will take um, for your recovery. Uh, and to give you an example of that, uh, my daughter has had, uh, ironically, my daughter has had five concussions. Um, and the first three, uh, she recovered uneventfully. And then the fourth one, I, I started noticing that the, she wasn't recovering uneventfully. In fact, it was taking her longer to recover. Um, and there was more symptoms. And by the fifth concussion, uh, I noticed that there was a dramatic change uh, in her response to that event. In fact, um, my daughter's in, in grade 12 doing um, uh, university calculus. She's got the mathematical mind like my husband. However, after that concussion, um, she couldn't do simple mul multiplication. If you asked her five times five, it would take her several minutes to really, or several seconds to really try to figure that out. And that was my red flag for her to say, okay, you're done playing competitive ice hockey because this is the rest of your life in your hands. Um, so it's really a complex injury um, that is so precarious in nature. And again, because we don't have a diagnostic tool to identify a concussion, it's pretty much based on the individual, the circumstance and the previous history. Next slide. So again, um, it's not straightforward, it's not linear, and it's not consistent between individual and individual. There's diverse causes of concussion. It's not just a sport related um, injury. It can happen to anyone, anytime, any place. You do not need to lose consciousness to sustain a concussion or be diagnosed, diagnosed with a concussion. There's an onset of symptoms that can appear immediately or subtly, and no two concussions are alike. They can last for days, weeks, months, and vary between individual to individual. And if your symptoms are persisting beyond 30 days, then you need to seek multidisciplinary care so that you get the immediate treatment and management guidance for your recovery. Next slide. Yeah, and again, just kind of to, to wrap this up, um, this is all about that immediate recognition and response. And, and I just can't tell you how important it is for everyone to be on board with this. And, and regardless of your position in, in, in the film industry or in live performance sector, um, 
any observer, or any peer, or any colleague can make a difference on this one. Um, you know, we need to work on our, our patient reporting and compliance and changing that culture around reporting. Um, you know, we need to make sure that people are taking it slow and not working at our fast pace that we keep in our, our industries. And, and again, getting the care we need when and support uh, on the back end um, when it does happen to us. And um, I'm, you know, I'm just really hoping that, that this information has left some of you with more knowledge and given you some tools that you can use and um, some resources to fall back on and um, so that we can and all make improvements in this area going forward. And um, I think now I guess we're happy to take some questions. Hello, it's Kate here. Uh, we have about 10 minutes left in the presentation. I have one question that's come in. If anybody has questions they wanna ask directly, please send them in now. Um, and if we get to the, the show what you know game show portion, great. And if not, it's more important that we answer your questions that you have. The one question I have is the visualization of axon shearing was extremely visceral for me. Is there a similar one on regeneration? Uh, this person has so many science nerd questions on the healing process. <laughs> um, I'm sure there are um, videos based on that. I don't have anything that I can refer to offhand, but I'm happy to, to look for something and provide that to you uh, if you want to drop us a quick email. And I think our last slide has my email uh, on it. The next question is concerning the concussion awareness training tool. They're looking for the link to the training tool. And I think the last slide will have the website. It's um, catonline.com. There it is. Uh, excellent. Yeah. And that's, I don't have any other questions at this time. I just want to make a comment about the cat online. Um, like before I met Shalina a couple of years ago and, and, and started, you know, focusing on what cat online was and what it had you know, when I had members that had concussions and you're trying to find resources in the community and you're trying to find resources online, it is, it is all over the map. Like it is so hard to find out what is current, what is, what is, um, what is the best science? What, what is, you know, what's the leading edge stuff. And then what I realized is when we got to cat online is all there, all the resources is there. Like there's so many great resources and, and whenever there's a medical update, it's posted or whenever there's research that's done, it's posted on that website. So um, it's kind of the, the one-stop shop now for, for me when I'm referring um, injured workers or helping families or helping my, my kids who they're, I've had a lot of concussions in ringette, my kids play or, you know, in gymnastics, there's been other concussions and diving, there's been concussions. So um, we're, I'm, everything is going towards Cat Online. So I, I really get to know that website and that resource. Um, and it takes away all the clutter that's out there on the internet for, for, you know, what may not be medically sound or current information on how to help your, your colleagues or your, your coworkers or your patients or your clients. All right, we don't have any other questions that have come in. So maybe you wanna take five minutes or so and do some of your show what you know. Sure, yeah. Great. Okay. So we need to pull that up on the screen. First question is up on screen. screen. Okay, okay, great. So question number one. The first thing you should do in the event of a potential concussion incident is, so check that off and press submit and we'll see what everybody says. And hopefully everyone gets it right and we did a good job on the presentation. <laughs> yeah, checking for red flags, call your union rep, always important. Uh, call the first aid attendant, also important. Halting the activity or stopping. Okay, so let us know when we have our answers. Yay. Good stuff. So, okay. so yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, just to reiterate, yes, checking for red flags and um, call for the first aid attendant is important. But more than that, you need to stop immediately, immediately stop and then uh, call the first aid attendant uh, and check for red flags. I'm just going to cut in. We have another question that has come in. Okay. Uh, maybe it's too subjective, but can you give examples of what kind of modified duties someone who is recovering from a concussion can do safely? So that depends on what stage you are at, at the recovery. So the return to activity guideline on the concussion awareness training tool 
um, provide and the return to work actually provide you with some examples of what you can do through each stage um, because you want to do it very slowly and gradually. Um, we call it sub threshold activity levels, where you don't want to increase your heart rate um, too much too soon that can exacerbate your symptoms. So I encourage you to go to the CAD online uh, and look for those return to activity uh, or work guidelines. Um, the other, what you can do on, that res uh, on the site is that if you go to the resource section and you just type in return, the resources will populate on your left hand side so you don't have to sift through everything. Um, it's got a search bar on the right hand side what you want and it'll automatically pull up what you need that's relevant. Okay, next question. Okay. Shall I think this one's you? Right. Concussion symptoms are a, physical, paranormal, emotional, behavioral, cognitive, physical, behavioral, and emotional, or behavioral, emotional, chemical, and cognitive. Let's see what we get. We need that music in the background. I know, yeah, the Jeopardy music. Yeah. <laughs> and the responses? Excellent. Wow. That's wonderful. Yeah. Excellent. Okay. Okay. Next question. A previous concussion increases your risk of concussion. This should be a quick one. 50 50. Yeah. I hope everyone gets it right. Excellent. That is true. There is an additive component that we're seeing in the uh, literature and research. Great. Okay, next question. Anyone suspected with a concussion should be given ibuprofen to help with inflammation, can be given Tylenol to help with pain, <laughs> can be given both ibuprofen and Tylenol to give maximum relief from symptoms, and should not be given medication until they are assessed. Yes. I feel Yay. good. We did a good job, Lori. We must have done okay. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Okay, next one. You can you can have lots of energy when you have a concussion. Sorry, missing a word there. This will be an interesting one. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I, let me just um, speak to this a little bit. It's again, it's not linear, you can have more energy one day and less energy another day, you may feel like taking a nap one day, and you're good to go the next day. It's, it's, it's a rolling scale, so to speak. So your energy levels can fluctuate. Um, and it also depends on what you do that day as well, right? Maybe you did too much too soon to make you more tired or more symptoms the next day. So it really is not linear. Um, and, and don't get discouraged by that. Um, you know, uh, if you do it slowly and progressively, you will have a few setbacks, but that's totally normal in the process. Okay, next one. Anyone with a suspected concussion should drive themselves to get medically assessed as soon as possible, wait one hour before driving anywhere, or not drive until they've been medically assessed. Yes, I'm feeling improvements in the field already. <laughs> this is great. <laughs> okay, next one. Concussions can be caused by a really hard hit to the head, a hard hit to the body, or both. Right. So just to reiterate there, um, if you think of, say, for instance, a body check that happens in hockey, that not that's not necessarily a hit to the head. That's a hit to your upper back shoulder area that can cause your head to snap back, 
which would result in the movement of the brain inside the skull. So it's not just necessarily a hit to your head. It can be a part of your body causing your head to move back and forth rapidly. Yeah. And again, that idea of shaking mm -hmm. too much, banging our heads at rock concerts, maybe we'll, know. we'll have to do some research on that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> next, next one. Okay. This is for all our, our active stunt people out there and, and people. Concussions can be caused by falling, running into something, crashing vehicles, multiple repeated actions that shake or jar the head, being punched, being blown up, being struck by objects or all of the above. Yes, that one didn't take any time at all, did it? Of course, excellent. Okay, next one. Being blown up, wow. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> The okay. onset of concussion symptoms can be delayed for up to 48 hours, true or false? Yes. yes, great. We're doing great. Well done, everybody. Okay, next one. Okay, if you sustain a suspected concussion at work, you should lie down in a dark room, resume work if you feel okay, not repeat the same action or work that may have caused the suspected concussion. Yes. Excellent. Excellent. Yay. We're going to get rid of that risk of second impact altogether, abolish it from all workplaces in the province. Next question. Immediate medical advice for a diagnosed concussion includes limiting time spent on your phone or sleeping as much as you can until you're symptom free. Hmm. So let's talk about this one a little bit. Uh, the answer is limiting time spent on your phone. Um, you're, you're, you can sleep as much as you want within 48 hours for the first couple of days, but it's not until you're symptom free because on day three, you may still be experiencing symptoms, but we want you to resume a little bit of activity very slowly and gradually. And it wouldn't be, um, you know, telling someone don't use your phone for 48 hours isn't realistic. And we know that, um, you know, the phone has become, um, you know, a part of our daily lives. So you really want to limit it because you don't want to strain your eyes, which puts, puts the strain on the brain. So it really is about limiting time you spent on your phone and, and only sleeping as much as you want for two days maximum. Again, the evidence has shown if you do that beyond the two days, that show that has been shown to um, make your recovery longer. So it's Kate here, we are out of time. It's time to wrap things up. Um, I'll just let anybody know if you have questions that you didn't ask or you come up with questions later, you can email us at concussion at bcchr.ca and we're always happy to take your questions and help out. Thank you, Kate. Um, thank you. I just wanna say thank you to ActSafe for inviting us to speak to you today. Um, I hope we were able to um, provide you with some knowledge uh, and information around concussion recognition, responding, and, and how to deal with it. Uh, Lori, anything to just wrap up? Yeah, no, I'm just, um, again, thanks. Yeah, AXA for sure. This is a great opportunity. And, uh, you know, I understand that this education process of getting the word out there about concussions is a slow and steady grind and you know every time like when we've got a room full of people that understand now that you don't give Advil to people or you don't let them drive is like a huge huge win um please share your knowledge uh, don't be afraid to to say what you know or say hey I think there's a concussion protocol we could use you know in our theater company or you know that sort of thing so um that that's great um the, the work on education will continue and uh thank you for participating and and uh share your knowledge the presentation has been provided as a PDF. It's in the chat box. So if anybody wants to download it, uh, do that before you sign out. Um, and again, if you have any questions, just let us know through the email. Thank okay, you. thank you so much, everybody. And was a very informative session for sure.
Uh, thank you, Dr. Babu and Lori. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.